It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It is the last show of 2018. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. It's been such an awesome year. Mark, we had a good year, right? We interviewed all these great people. We had amazing calls and emails. We uh, we won some awards. We won our Gracie Award. And what else did we do? We got the award from NAPFA, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. We won an award from uh, the journalists, right? We got that NIFI, the financial education one. Dude, three awards. All right. Uh, So it is the end of the year. And uh, I don't know. I've had this. I talked about this last week, but I've had this weird research has been really stayed with me, actually. And it's about the taboo of talking about money. And I was thinking about this because I've been trying to do research. Why are people so averse to discussing money? And I know that it has long been a social taboo. But unlike politics or sex, this one actually endured. And I was thinking back, remember that interview we did with Lisa Damore, the psychologist, Mark? She said that one of the reasons that money is such a loaded topic is that it's so concrete, right? It's this thing that's in everyone's life. And so you can put anything you want, any emotion that you want can put be put into your conversation and thoughts around money, fear, anxiety, uncertainty, feelings of inadequacy, shame. It can all get wrapped up. When we talk about this with spouses, I've always sort of said, like, no heat, no drama. But I think also with your kids and also with your parents, if you've got adult parents who are aging, set aside a specific time and place to talk about this topic. And regardless of who's involved, just make some ground rules. There's no judgments. There's open dialogue. And when you're talking to your spouse, you really want to know that you can share information. So it's outstanding debt or any of those secret accounts you've got going on. Um, Make sure you're on the same page when it comes to your priorities, you know, retirement and risk and college planning and cash flow. And if you're talking to your kids, be honest about what you can afford for college and start that conversation when that kid's a freshman. And if you're talking to your aging parent, please have these conversations before something bad happens. The last thing I'll say about this is, you know, I think it's encouraging that more and more younger millennials are talking about they're talking about their pay at work. And I think that's good. I think that actually can reveal some some pay inadequacies. And now let us start the show with a call. It's Aaron from Salt Lake City on the line. Hello, Aaron. How are you? Hi, Jill. I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for taking my call. Oh, I'm so happy to chat with you. Tell me what is going on and how we can help you out. Thanks. So my question is more about savings prioritization. Mm -hmm. Um, My husband and I are saving up for a house, and I just became eligible for my company's 401k plan. He's been eligible for his for a while now. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm just wondering what our priority should be. Is it house savings or maxing out my 401k? Tell me about what's going on in general. So you said you're married. How old are you guys? I'm 27. He's 32. Is he contributing to his retirement account? Yeah, we max his out every year, and we've been maxing out our IRAs every year as well. So he's putting in last year 18000 18500 this year, or maxing out to the match? Putting in the eighteen five. Okay, so he's eighteen five, and then you're each putting in 5500 to your Roths, which is great. That's right. How much do you guys make together? Combined, it's about 215 Okay, fantastic. How big a house are you going to buy? In other words, how much are you going to spend on a house? Um, that is variable. Um, <laughs> we, we're hoping for something in like the $350,000 range, but if we can't get what we want for that, maybe we'd go a little higher, maybe up to like four twenty five. Oh, look at you. It's always the creeping up, isn't it? All right, so you need to save 80 or 90,000 bucks, let's just say. Uh, right. How much have you saved so far for the house down payment? So right now we're sitting right around 30, 35. Okay. Presumably you want to save up for the 20% down to get the best possible 
mortgage rate, right? Right. Although maybe this is a bad idea, but we wouldn't mind, I guess, paying for PMI. You mean in the for short term? Yeah, I get. I I would think about that. I I understand what you mean. Are you guys both in stable careers? Yes, I don't foresee any real changes unless I decide to take some time off um, to raise kids. But that you're not, not allowed to take time off if we're going to go through this whole plan. I'm totally kidding. You can do whatever <laughs> you them. want. I promise. Uh, all right. So, how much are you putting into the house down payment fund right now? I don't know, probably like five, three to five grand a month. Mm -hmm. You said you just are eligible for your own retirement plan. Have you elected to do anything yet? Yeah, I elected to get in up to the match. They'll match 4%. Okay. So I did that so that we can at least take advantage of that. But I could always jump it up a little bit if we want to. How much money is in your husband's 401k right now? He has like 67. And how much is in your Roth IRA? Each of your Roth IRAs or combine them. It's fine with me. So mine's about 20 and his is about 17. Okay. A few things. I mean, you really, you really want to buy this house, right? That is that when you're saying your priorities, you're saying you really want to buy. That's your number one priority. I think so. I mean, do you guys have kids yet or not? Yeah, we have two little kids. Okay. Um, I mean, if, since that's your priority, I would start shifting a little bit more money into the house down payment fund. So, I mean, you've you've done a really good job of putting money away. You could, you know, divert instead of saying I'm going to put eighteen five into your husband's four hundred one k this year. You can pull it back a little bit and say, hey, you know what? Let me let me put in half of that and put the rest in the house down payment fund. If you want to get into a house and that is your priority, then let's make that your priority. In some combination here, we're trying to free up the money to get your house down payment fund up to what is likely to be your real down payment of close to 85,000 or not. I I don't feel bad about giving you that advice. I know it seems very contrary to say lighten up on your retirement contributions at a time um, when I'm trying to yell at people for like, please, or you couldn't put money into retirement, start as early as you can. You've done a very good job. But if we're going to pay for that house, I really don't like PMI. And it's it's sort of a this extra cost that there's no real reason to have because you guys seem to have the cash flow to save up to actually get that down payment. That said, if you had to and you found the house of your dreams or not such a dream, but you found the right house, you could put less money down and then really work hard to wipe out the PMI as soon as you you get it. Ideally, we'd want the 20 down, you lighten up on the retirement contributions, then crank it back up as soon as you got the house fund all set. Gotcha. Are you comfortable with the way you're investing the money right now in the retirement accounts? Are you guys very aggressive? or Where are you right now? I mean, I think it's pretty aggressive. We're at like 80, 90 percent stocks. Mm -hmm. I think they're just in target date funds for the most part. All right. That's fine. The the most important thing is whatever that house fund is invested in is safe. So really boring on that part of it. Keep doing what you're doing. It sounds like you're in good shape. We'll get back to more of your great questions in just a minute. You are listening to Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. All you have to do is hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com, click on the Contact Us button, and check out a lot of the content we've got while you're there. Okay, we'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Mark said I talked too much to open the show, so let's get going here. Let's go to our caller, Kristen. She is on the line from Florida. What can I do for you? So I have some fairly significant um, educational debt that I have been paying off over the years. Um, I don't qualify for any kind of um, repayment assistance. So I will be paying back every single cent that I borrowed. Mm. And yes, (laughs) and I have, um, basically I have two sets of loans and I have a little emergency fund that I've been working on. And because the um, interest that I'm paying on my loans is so much higher than the interest I'm getting on my emergency fund, I was wondering if it would make sense to use um, 
my funds to pay off one of my loans. Mm. Okay, so tell me what you have left in the loans. So I have about um, 28500 left in my consolidated federal loans. Mm-hmm. Um, those have a, um, a set interest rate of 4.45%. Okay. And then I have about 16000 um, that are in variable loans that right now I'm paying about 4%, but I'm seeing it go up. Okay, so that's the one that's a little bit more at risk because you're scared it's going to keep rising. Yes, that's the one I'm scared of. That's the one that I, I could pay off with my emergency fund, if you think that makes sense. Okay, so you've got these two debts. How's your income? It's um, not what it used to be, but is steadily improving. I just got a little raise, so I'm making about 133 now. 133. Are you single or married? Married. And does spouse earn a decent living? He's an academic. Um, so That's a very I'm, funny way of saying answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he's not going to lose his job, but he makes no he money. Steady income. Yes, it's steady, though. <laughs> How much does he earn? I would say he averages about 85 a year. Oh, that's good. Is yeah, he like a he tenure is. track guy? He is. Oh, are you managing your own student loans based on your income? Or do you guys glom everything together and kind of call it ours? Um, we kind of divide things up. So, so I have been managing my own student loans. Yeah. Okay. Are you also making a retirement contribution on that $133,000 of income? Yes. I think I'm, I've been working an extra percentage every year. I think I'm at about 9% now. That's great. Good for you. Okay. It's better than nothing. <laughs> it's well, it's nine percent better than nothing. So it's better than yes. nothing, nothing. Okay. Uh, yes. You guys got kids? We do. Oh, that was a bad. Mo- that's a loser <laughs> move when it comes to finances. No, I'm only kidding. How many kids? We have two. Okay. How old? They are four. Oh, uh, twins. Yes. Identical or? They are fraternal. They're both boys. The money that you have, you said you have like in um, your emergency reserves. How much mm-hmm. is in that emergency reserve fund? I think it's about eighteen or nineteen thousand. And that's for both of you, or is that yours and not his? And does he have? Well, one? I'm the only one who saves. So I ah, for both of us. Okay. So, do you have any idea about how much money you spend on an annual basis? Besides what we're saving for retirement mm-hmm. and a little tiny savings in our five twenty nines. Um, we're we're pretty much spending what we make. I I take um, two fifty out of my paycheck every other week. Okay. All right. So it's it's not like there's tons of breathing room here. So here's the thing. I think your original question is of that emergency reserve of that eighteen nineteen thousand. Should I take some of that money and pay off that variable interest? student loan, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And there's no credit card debt or anything nasty floating around out there that I should know no, about? No, no. That's okay. the student debt. And you guys own a home or do you rent? We own. And how much is your house worth? Um, it's worth probably 475 almost 500 Okay. And the mortgage that's outstanding, how much is that? I think we have about 324 left on it. Great. What's the interest yeah, rate on the mortgage? It's a um, 4% fixed, 30 year. Perfect. Okay. Very good. Um, So I am loath to tell you to drain an emergency reserve fund. I mean, his job is stable, it sounds like. You sound like you've got a bit more variable uh, income, correct? Yes. So I'm a little bit worried because I would bet that you are spending... You know, a pretty decent chunk of money, probably ten grand a month is my guess, is what you like if you added everything up. And I mm-hmm. bet that you need a bigger emergency reserve. Maybe you're spending eight a month. I don't know how tight you really are running your household. Yeah, I would say eight or nine probably. Eight? Okay. So if we did eight, then you know, if even if I in the best case scenario, that would mean that I would argue that you should have fifty grand in an emergency reserve fund. Do you have any access to other money? Do you have like a an, an equity line of credit that's available? Not that you would tap it, but it's available if some like the crap hit the fan. Yeah, we do. We have a line of twenty five thousand, mm-hmm. and we're pay, we ha, we had drawn some of that down, and we're down to about seven thousand left. What was that? Um, Why did but, you draw that down? 
when our children first started daycare, mm. my job was more part time, mm-hmm. and we needed the money to pay for daycare. Okay, but that yeah. you don't need to dip into it now. No, now we're doing just fine. Okay, great. And is the equity line based on you know like LIBOR some you know variable rate? Is it a small amount? I presume it's. Yeah, it's variable. Right now, I think it's at about 5%. A few different priorities that I'm going to float out here. I think you need to beef up your emergency reserve fund, but don't do it right this second. So no, the answer to the original question, don't drain your emergency reserve fund to pay off the variable student loan. Next, Um, just for the heck of it, just because I'm a nervous Nelly in general, um, you've got plenty of equity in your home. Call the mm-hmm. bank and say, oh, you know what? We're considering that we would like to do some work on our house and pay some bills. We're not sure yet, but we want to increase the available amount of credit to 50000 from 25000 Okay. Just have it. Don't draw it down. Do yeah, not draw this down, okay? But you yeah. want it available because, God forbid, there is some weird thing that happens. I want you to be able to tap something quickly, all right? Okay. Now, next, priority-wise, given that the home equity is at 5%, pay that down first. Pay that first. Yep, 5% goes first. Next, once that's freed up, then you can start to try to whittle down the 16 and the 28 grand, okay? Okay. You really can. And then, so you got an increase. The reason why, again, everyone listening, I'm not telling her to pull the money out of the house to pay down the, the loan for school. We are saying... Have the home equity line of credit established but not drawn down in case of an emergency. You're going to pay off the home equity loan. That's going to be done. Then regular payments on the house. Then the extra money that you have, start pushing it towards the college loan debt and start whittling that down as quickly as you can. If all of a sudden, instead of making $133,000, you are making $200,000 because you're fabulous, um, then then we will start to really accelerate the student loan debt in a much bigger way. For now, keep putting money away into your retirement account while you are paying all this other stuff down. When you get that moment of, oh my God, I should be putting money away for my kid's college education, just think Mm -hmm. about what Aunt Jill would say. You ready? Don't, Don't do that. Don't do that. You've got to take for my children's college. No, screw them. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the The reason why is I need to take care of your financial situation first. You know, you're making really good money, but you're not making really good money relative to the fact that you still have some debt to clean up. So once you clean up the debt, what's going to happen is that you are going to keep putting money into retirement. Your debt is going to be gone. And at that moment, you'll pay for some stuff. I mean, look. Just out of curiosity, if you added up your student loan payments right now, how much are they on a monthly Um, basis, approximately? Approximately 800 a month. Okay, so like in a few years when the kids are seven, then you'll put 800 bucks a month into a 529 plan. Okay, when we return, more of your great questions during the break. Go to JillOnMoney.com. There you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It's free and it comes out weekly. And it's called Jill on Money. All right. When we return, more of your great questions. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money, and if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Very easy to contact us. You can just send us an email, askjill at JillOnMoney.com. Hey, I got uh, some interesting uh questions just about people who are talking to their kids about college, and they may have heard our interview with Beth Kobliner. Um, Just a reminder, BethKobliner.com, and the section of that is, we need to talk college. That's one thing. And also, uh, just want to plug our friend of the show, Kelly Peeler, Next Gen Vest. Next Gen Vest actually helps your 
kids gather the financial resources necessary and also helps with the process of applying for college. Um, Next Gen Vest also helps you get aid more easily. So there are two things to think about. Right. And now back to your questions. That's what we like to do. Uh, here's a question um, where concerning IRA accounts. Uh, SIPC, Securities Investor Protection Corporation, is limited to $5,000 per account. Does that mean it makes sense to open multiple IRA accounts and keep balances significantly below $500,000? Eh, that's not like my... All right, so SIPC is basically to protect you against the the institution's failures. But I just think that in an IRA account, that money is yours. It's it's not like the IRA money is being used for any sort of... Um, you know, lending purposes. It's not It's not a margin account. I just don't think you have to go crazy with this. Mark, do you have a differing opinion? Do you want to make lots of, I mean, I just think it's, yes, if you were with like Joe's investors, as opposed to say Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, a large institution, maybe, but I, I don't think you should go crazy about this. Another question. My 401k is invested in funds that are called unitized funds. They're not registered to the SEC. To roll those funds over, I assume they would have to be liquidated first into cash and then rolled over. Probably. I mean, unless you have a, a, a custodian that would hold those unregistered funds. But probably going to just go to zero and move on. Okay. Here is a question from Angelo, who read an article on financial planning in uh, the Chicago Tribune, where the Jill on Money uh, column is emanates Chicago. Okay. Angelo is almost 65 and he's going to work for a couple more years to give his wife a chance to catch up to her, to him for Medicare purposes. As you can ma- imagine, we have been bombarded by mailings for free lunches, dinners, classes, financial planners, everything. Okay. We're taking one of them up on a free assessment and a stress test, but I remain cautious, maybe suspicious of their ability to help us beyond what we've already planned. In our case, here's what they got. IRA, both Roth and traditional, 401ks, Roth and traditional, non-retirement savings, long-term care insurance, life insurance, and a trust, including the will and a health care proxy. But we have no plan tying them all together. Social Security will be our main source of income during retirement with whatever dividends our investments will supply. We have estimated our expenses in retirement as well. Having said all that, Do you think there is value in going to a CFP or best to rely on the planning services offered through our 401k provider, Charles Schwab, or other investment providers for our other retirement investments, T. Rowe Price, Morgan Stanley? This may sound like a silly question. I'm confused about what value a CFP might bring to our situation other than tying everything together. Is my thinking faulty? Thank you in advance. Angela, that's not faulty thinking, but I think that is it. It's tying it together, making sure a plan makes sense, making sure you're investing appropriately for your needs. That's what they do. If you've done that work yourself, then I wouldn't necessarily go pay for that. If you're saying, gosh, I just like another set of eyes on that, that's different. I want, you know, I want somebody to double check that what we've been doing is the right thing for us that we can really manage ourselves going forward. Yeah, you can pay someone to do that. You could pay a CFP. You could pay um, any sort of, you could actually do this yourself. You know what? I'll tell you what. Let me make a plug here for a paid service that might suit you perfectly. It is called esplanner.com. esplanner.com. It was actually created by a a very interesting guy. uh, uh, I think it's a BU. Um, and it's a paid calculator. And I don't think it's that expensive. I think it's like 150 or 200 bucks. And maybe you should go through that first and see the feedback you get because that might be a more efficient way for you to do it. And then all you're going to do once you do retire is you're going to consolidate all this stuff. Uh, and, and then maybe you don't need to do anything. And, and I would... Just pick one of your providers. And by the way, you have three here listed, Schwab, T. Rowe Price, and Morgan Stanley. I would do either Schwab or T. Rowe Price because obviously Morgan Stanley's full service and it's going to be more expensive. So I would say if you're going to do it yourself, maybe try esplanner.com. It's a paid calculator. We have that on the website if anyone else is interested. Okay. Brenda writes, 
She's got money in a 401k from a previous employer. The management fee is cheap. They don't do much. I haven't rolled it over yet because uh, the company, <laughs> the company that has about seventy thousand dollars of my other retirement money, a Roth, wants to charge one percent if I roll the three hundred grand over to them. This seems high. Thoughts? One uh, percent's not high. It's sort of standard. Um, so here's the deal: you're going to have three hundred seventy thousand dollars total. And here's more of the information. Uh, She's 67, working full-time, single, hasn't filed for Social Security. Small Roth with present job. Uh, Just got a lot of other stuff here, but uh, some paid-up life insurance. You know, trying to work longer. She said, uh, you know, she wants to quit her job full-time, but she's trying to grow her Social Security for that 8% a year. So lots of things in here. I think, again, sort of a similar situation, which is, do you really want to pay someone to take a look at this? That's number one. Number two, can you manage the money yourself and not put the money at Raymond James? Could you take the 70 at Raymond James plus the new 300 and just go into a low-cost provider? And when we talk about low-cost providers, we're talking about the big firms that have lots of index funds, Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, TD Ameritrade, Schwab, These are all places where you could do this and not pay 1%. And if you don't really want to pay, if you want to pay something but not the full 1%, you should check out some of the alternatives, the online platforms. There there are plenty of them out there. Check it out. And if you've got more questions, just follow up with us, okay? Thanks for writing. If you've got a financial question we want to hear from you, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. Someone said something about IG and I had no idea what it was. And I had to then say to Mark, what is IG? And he says, I believe that is Instagram. Oh, I get it. We have an Instagram account here at Jill on Money. Mark's running it, rocking it. I send him stuff. He takes care of everything else. So great. If you've got a financial question, we really would love to hear from you. Uh, You know, we're not going to make you crazy. We're going to try to do this with a little bit of a sense of humor. And sometimes when you come on the air, I I probably can get a little bit more information out of you. But, you know, regardless, feel free to give us a holler. The email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Mary wanted to know about a Social Security question. She's married and writes, I receive a Social Security benefit in the amount of $413 a month. I also receive a retirement income in the amount of $6,860. I don't know if that's a monthly, um, I don't know if that's monthly income, but if it is, that's a good number. Okay, Mary's question. I had a prior marriage that ended in divorce. I was married for 12 years. That's important, gang, because when you look at an ex, if you're married for more than 10 years, that's kind of the the big marker in terms of Social Security. Now, that husband passed away in 2015. The question is, am I entitled to any further Social Security benefit? I've been told I am not. She says due to my retirement income, but I don't think that's the issue. I don't think the retirement income would do it. The question is whether half of your ex-husband's benefit would be more than the benefit you receive. I don't know if you're looking for, you know, the half of his retirement benefit or what have you. But I'll tell you what, um, as one guy who was, you know, sort of like talks about Social Security all the time said to me recently, When you have a question, call Social Security. It's like a pain in the neck, but it is actually worth doing. So I would check that out. I don't, I I think that it may be, it's not because of your retirement income that would prevent you. It would probably be that the benefit amount may not be worth it for you, which is completely different, right? Okay. Next question. Um, Okay. Here is from Sherwin. Um, And he said, 
I agree with your recent comment about assuming that your advisors put you first. Even with the best of intentions, uh, of many advisors rationalize recommendations that might be good, um, but not necessarily mention others that are better. He is a CPA with 52 years experience, and he says, I can simply state that ethics cannot be taught. Either one truly looks out for his client's best interest or does not. The new fiduciary standard is not going to change any of this. The standards just restate what the ethics had required, with the biggest difference being the disclosure of fees. Compliance has tried to enforce the concept of fiduciary responsibility for decades. One thinks that laws and regulations will cure everything, but for the most part, it's just a form of substance and nothing really changes. We've all experienced people who have stayed with advisors because the representative was nice and the client has difficulty accepting that the performance of the portfolio was below similar standards based on risk. Investors need to be educated as to the proper questions to ask advisors, then seek a couple of other advisors' presentations before choosing one. Uh, Your thoughts on my comments would be appreciated. You know, I disagree. I think that you're right. You cannot... um, I think that that the fiduciary standard would basically make practices that are currently commonplace a lot harder to justify. I think it would be very hard to justify how you would put a variable annuity um, take a, you know inside of an IRA umbrella. I think that there are certain things that would cert- just become less common in terms of what people do. And yes, you know, you'd like to believe that everybody is. Um, either ethical or not, but I do think that rules and regulations kind of rein people in and help you understand at least the nature of the relationship you have. So that's just my two cents, okay? Uh, Cynthia writes that she lives in California. Property taxes are painful. She's trying to figure out the best approach to the dilemma um, and better way to plan for next year. She says, I want to put some money away monthly and have it ready for next year. What's your suggestion? CD, money market, what sites are there, and how can I educate myself? Um, a really good site is depositaccounts.com, um, and there you're going to find some higher-yielding money market accounts. Um, some of the online products are great. The uh, We had the guys, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. They have a very good product out there. Um, and I think that I've been in, I, I think that, you know, if you can get a couple percent and it's liquid, that's probably where you want to go. I don't think that a CD is going to work as well because you're putting small dollars to work um, at intervals. So that's what I would do, Cynthia. Check out depositaccounts.com. Look for the higher yielding money markets. And it's probably going to be with an online bank like a Marcus by Goldman Sachs. That's my wreck. Okay. You are listening to Jill on Money, and maybe during the break, what you should do is go onto the website, jillonmoney.com, bookmark it, and uh, be sure to check out my book, where you can pre-order that book right online. Just click on the link that says The Book. So easy. And the book is called The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. You know we all do them. Some dumb things have to happen in the form of a, a crazy investment where someone gets caught up in the, I don't know, euphoria. Something like a, a Bitcoin investment. Hmm. I wonder what producer can relate to that. Okay, you are listening to Jill on Money. When we return, more of your questions. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. And here's a question from Tom, who's asking about some 529 timing questions. First of all, I wish he would say this out loud. Question for you, my financial wizard. (laughs) I like that. I've asked this question of others. I'm stumped them. So I'm going to try with you. Uh, okay. I've got twin girls. They're sophomores at Purdue. They recently made mention of contemplating postgrad degrees for them. Got my mind racing. I funded undergraduate costs, but not beyond. Once they make their decision, I want to restart contributions for them. 
And my question is, can I use future 529 contributions to cover qualified education expenses from prior calendar years that were funded with alternate sources? No, you can't. I actually know that. You can't do it. You can't go backwards. And the money that is used for 529 has to happen in the calendar year. So there are rules about that, and so you can't, unfortunately. So no, I'm sorry. Um, And those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Uh, So one thing to think about is if you, you know, if you are going, if you've already paid the money, you know, you can't get it back, you can use future contributions to cover their money and if you've already in other words if let's say that you've got some money left in there what you may want to do is try to pay some out of cash flow and let that 529 money continue to accumulate or you could do what mark would do which is you're on your own for grad school that's the general thesis he's got going so you cannot use future 529 contributions to cover your prior calendar years that were funded with alternate sources you cannot do that so sorry, the wizard, the wizardress has spoken. Okay. All right, that's it for the uh, the hour. And when we come back, we're going to get into more of your financial questions. So please just give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And during the break, why don't you just sign up for our free weekly newsletter? You can do that on our website, JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger well this is the last show of the year it's so sad no it's not everything is great uh and we are so delighted that you are with us and for this show we are playing portions of mark's absolute favorite interview of the year i think was this your favorite mark no oh he says oh i know the china hustle was his favorite but this is number two probably we are talking to ken langone um he is an amazing entrepreneur and you know it's funny if you just you know if you look him up right what do you hear you say oh he is a businessman and investor he uh is but best known for organizing financing for the founding of the Home Depot. He's got an estimated worth net worth of more than $3 billion. That's not the interesting part of him. The interesting part is he wrote a book called I Love Capitalism. And it and he in it, he tells the story of his life. And we are lucky enough that we snagged him for an in-studio interview. This is a delightful, great story. Here is part of our interview with Ken Langone. You were born to uh, Italian American parents on the North Shore of Long Island. Yep. They, who's first generation? Your grandparents or your parents? My parents are first generation. Your parents are first generation. Working class. Dad yeah, was a plumber? My father was a plumber. He went to the eighth grade. Yep. My mother worked in the school cafeteria. She went to the seventh grade. And you lived on what you so, sort of describe as like the bad side of the tracks well, in was, a nice it town. Where, it was where the poor people lived. Yeah. You know, we had a. I think my parents paid four thousand dollars for the house they bought, which they couldn't buy, and they were living renting the house for a few years. It was it was uh, right by the public school. How is it that your parents, who were not educated, were so encouraging that you become educated? Because a lot of people who grew up as tradespeople, children of tradespeople, mm-hmm. go into the trade. My father made me learn to be a plumber on weekends in high school. I used to help him, so I could do all the things a plumber does: wipe a joint. Hit a hit a joint for copper tubing with lead, uh, thread a pipe, cut pipe, all this. This stuff. is great because I need some work on my. Uh, well, go my to Home apartment. Depot. Oh. We got a lot of people <laughs> that can really help you, and we got great prices and everything you need. Okay. Okay, so you learn you learn the trade, but but what was it that they knew about being educated? My parents, God bless them, didn't 
blame themselves for where they were. They felt if they had the chance for an education, they'd have done better than they did. And we used to go to my grandparents in Port Washington for lunch every Sunday. This is they all got together. We would drive through a wealthy section of town called Roslyn Estates. And when we would drive through there, every time we'd drive through there, Mom would say to me, I was sitting in the back of the panel truck. She was sitting in the front on a, on a makeshift chair seat. And she'd say, would you like to live here someday? And I said, yes. She said, well, you're going to have to work hard and get an education. So she okay. knew. Okay. Well, they understood because they knew they could be capable of doing so much more, but they lacked the tickets. And meanwhile... You, they're telling you be educated, and you say you weren't such a great student. Uh, I, I didn't. You know, I, <laughs> I wanted to make money. I hear you. You say it in, like, very plain English Wait, right here on page six. I loved making money. Yeah, I was, hell, I, 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 I delivered newspapers. I was a caddy. I worked in a gas station. I worked in a butcher shop. I used to take the cardboard out from the liquor store. There was a supermarket in Rosalind called M&H that opened up. At the same time, I was working for the butcher shop, which was a competitor. At nights, I was helping them set up the store without the butcher shop knowing I was working two jobs. I mean, it's interesting. You say, I was never academically curious, and I didn't apply myself at all. So, But you did say math came easy to you, so that oh, was, was good. Numbers were just like that. Tell me about how you then headed to Bucknell University. How'd you get there? Understand that that I did okay in high school. Numbers and me got along very well, and I still do. Mm -hmm. I had pretty much convinced myself that I wasn't a student, and I wanted to go into the Marine Corps in 1953 because the Korean War was still on. Mm -hmm. My brother was in the Army, my older brother. I only had one brother. And I took the position that this is what I wanted to do. Well, Eisenhower had different plans at the end of the war, mm -hmm. so I said, what am I going to do? And I went to see friends of mine from Port Washington, Jim McNamara, J.R. Davis, Stan Cutler, they were at Bucknell. Uh, I went there, and it was house party weekend, and I said, Jesus, this is what you do in college. <laughs> I could do this really well. well. This fits me. I, yes, I can execute so on this. So they had Saturday morning classes, and that morning, that Saturday morning, they said, look, we have to go to class. Why don't you go over and see the guy over in the building over there? He's the guy that lets people in. It was called the registrar. His name was George Faint. And I went over, and I said, he said, I'm sitting there, and he says, what are you waiting for? I said, well, my friend said I should come see you. What about? I said, well, I'm in high school. You're a senior? I said, yeah, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. He said, well, come on in my office. So we talked for an hour. The following Thursday, I get a letter from him that if I want to come to Bucknell, he'd be happy to have me. That may be the best decision that anyone from Bucknell ever made. No, the best decision anybody from Bucknell ever made, Yeah, and it's in the book, was my economics professor who wanted to know if anybody ever told me I was stupid. And I said, yes, everybody. And he said to me, you know the only sin? You believed it. And That's he great said, advice. And he said to me, how are you doing in your other classes? I said, about as bad as I'm doing in your class. He said, well, you know, you're going to be out of here in January. I said, yeah, I know that. And he said to me, is that what you want to happen? I said, no, I don't. He's okay. He said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll reach out to all your other professors. You promise me you'll work, give it everything you got, and we'll see if we can put you out of this nose dive. And they did. It's something interesting to me that many people will say the difference between someone making it and not making it, whether and you I know you're involved in the charter school movement. Right. It can be anyone from a coach, a music teacher, an academic mm -hmm. teacher mm -hmm. who just says, hey, you, you, Ken, what's going on here? And they see something in you. Yeah. I, look, every place I look, I see people that I know have helped me to do what I've done. And in many cases, have done more than I've done myself. And that is why you say you are not a self-made man. I am man. the furthest thing from a self-made man you'll ever know. Okay? And I, I, my regret on that, I'm not regret, I hope I didn't, I, this, I don't know how many hundreds of names there are in there, but I hope I didn't leave anybody out. But if I did, it was a bad memory. Yeah. Not that they didn't participate. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how you left college and uh, you said you're going to go, you know, it's like... Uh, where the bank robber goes, he's going to go to the bank. Uh, that's where the money is. Right. You said the money's in Wall Street. So yeah. you graduate and you go talk to some folks. I do love this advice uh, from uh, Maurice Hart. And he says, quote, let me tell you the lay of the land. We have Jewish firms for Jewish kids. We have WASP firms for WASP kids. The Irish, we make the clerks. We put them on the floor of the stock exchange. Ica Italian kids like you, we put in the back office. What did you think when you heard that? Uh, I didn't appreciate the fact that here was discrimination. 
But I know one thing. I made my mind up. That ain't going to hold me back. You have no idea the price we're paying for our entitlement system in America. Not the money, but the number of people that don't get a chance to develop self-respect by doing it for themselves. You've got to respect yourself first before you're going to respect anybody else. Somebody who has no respect for themselves has a difficult time seeing good in somebody else. I, I view that more as an opportunity than as a setback. But I always, I admired him. He was with a firm called New York Hands the Attic, and I so admired him for being so thoroughly blunt with me. Okay, we'll be right back with more of our fantastic interview with Ken Langone. If you've got a financial question, you're ready to figure out what to do to make 2019 really great for you, give us a holler. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back with Jill on Money. And uh, it's the last weekend of 2018. Are you taking stock? Are you just trying to figure out where you stand? Are you trying to get a handle on what you're going to do next year to make your financial future just a tiny bit better? If that's the case, give us a shout. Send us an email. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Or you can just go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and you can click the Contact Us button. And there you can also subscribe to our podcast. It's a little different than the radio show. Not 100% different, a little different. But check it out. Check out the podcast. You can subscribe right on our website at jillonmoney.com. Okay, we're going back to our interview with Ken Langone. Again, this guy is such a character. He is so much fun to be around. He also just happens to be uh, a very humble dude. And when you hear his background, you know, he sort of s describes himself as a, a poor boy from Long Island. And how he got to sort of the top of the of the heap in business, including being a uh, co-founder of the Home Depot, the 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 story is amazing. He actually began his career on Wall Street, and you know Wall Street was such a different place then. And for him to actually figure out how to find his way and get to the best firms and this that, and the other it was it was really different i mean he even talks about how as a as a sort of a, a young italian kid the white shoe firms on wall street weren't that interested in him it's almost like if you were anything but a wasp you couldn't get a job back then so listen to this it's so great here's more of ken langone here at jill on money so I want to talk a little bit about how you did get into Wall Street selling securities, mm -hmm. and that was in the early 60s, and, and talk a little bit about what you did and how you then ultimately met Ross Perot. Okay. I was called back. I was in the Army once in, in 58 for six months, and then I got called back when they built a wall around Berlin in 61. When I got out in June of 62, I made my, Wall Street had had the biggest crash it had had since 1929 in May, and everybody was leaving Wall Street, and I said, hey, this is my moment to strike. And my father-in-law, God bless him, he was in the business, and he set me up with a series of appointments. And the fact that people were leaving and the firms were cutting back, I kept going, and I, I really was getting discouraged, but I wasn't going to give up. I had a wife and one child and a second one due in September of that year. And I met a man, and he said to me, I'd like to hire you. His name was Jack Cullen. He said, I'd like to hire you. But he said, we're cutting back, and we just can't do it. And I said, but he said, I think you're going to be a big success. He said, I think you got certain talent. I said, what's that? He said, well, you strike me as a very sensitive guy, and that's a great, great talent to have hmm. if you're going to sell. So he thanked me and said he couldn't help me. And I got in the elevator and I went down to the floor, down to the lobby. And I got, well, thought to myself, I said, wait a minute, I went right back upstairs. And I said, 
I'd like to see Mr. Cullen again. And I went in, and he said, what's up? Did you forget something? I said, no. I said, let me ask you a question. What do you pay a secretary? He said, we pay him about 150 bucks a week. I said, can you pay me as a secretary? He said, what do you mean? I said, can you pay me 150 a week? He said, well, you can't make it on that. I said, no, that's my problem. I was teaching at NYU at night. Mm. By the way, consider this. Barely 10 years from when I was told I was going to get thrown out of college, I'm now teaching at one of the great business programs in the country. And so I said, I'll make it. Don't worry about it. So then I said, but there's only one condition. You have to give me every account you're not doing business with. And boy, then I went to work. That's great. And so you were selling. Selling like crazy. And you are a salesman at heart. I love selling. Even if you love the numbers, the selling, you're a relationship guy. That's the sensitivity that he saw. It's all about the people. Absolutely. And that includes companies. Mm -hmm. Great companies are run by great people. Home Depot is a success it is because we had people like Bernie and Arthur and Pat. These were our partners when we started the company. Mm -hmm. All right. And these men were unique and special in every respect. All right. Let's get back to Ross Perez. How'd you meet him? I went to a party in Washington in, uh, in 1968, and I met a man there who said he was Perot's partner and Washington representative. Now, I didn't know who the hell Perot was. I didn't know what he did, and he started telling me, and I said, gee, that sounds like that's interesting. And he said to me, I said, gee, I said, is there a chance I can get in to meet this man? He says, well, call me on Monday. I'll see what I can do. The name was Jack Height. I called Jack on Monday. He said, look, you got an appointment. He said two things. You got 30 minutes. And he said, don't use any bad words. So I said, And you're oh, a little rough on the on the bad words. Side. I am what I am. I know, me too. Okay. Can't do it here, but it is yeah. what it is. I understand. You know, if you live in a trading room long enough, that becomes, That's part, exactly. of, that becomes part of the territory. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I went down and I met with him. And exactly at the point I was supposed to get in, I got into his office. And we were 30 minutes. And... For 29 and a half minutes, he told me everything he'd heard from Goldman Sachs, Whitewell, Merrill Lynch, Clark Dodge, GH, all these firms that were really trying to get his deal. And when he got all done, it was about 30 seconds left. And he said to me, what do you think of what I just said? And I think, well, I blew the 30-minute rule, right? Right. So I said, Mr. Perot, I said, pardon me, that's the biggest pile of horse I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) That's awesome. And he looked back, he took back, and he said, what do you mean? And we talked for 13 hours. We talked till 1 o'clock the next morning. Good God. I had not brought any clothes down, so he was driving us around Dallas looking for a drugstore where I could buy some toiletries and a T-shirt. Oh, my God. And we found out in that meeting we were married the same hour, the same day, the same year. His values and his integrity was so precious. And I, I said to him, I said, I'll never throw a curve at you. And he said, oh, he said, I was going to make a decision by Friday. This was Wednesday. He says, I'm going to put it off. He said, let's get to know each other better. So over three months, uh, he played with my head a couple of times. One time he called me and said, you know, he said, Ken, the thing that bothers me about you is you don't show your enthusiasm very well. I said, what? I'll be yeah. down there in five yeah, minutes. Right. You think that this thing, which is basically builds like the electronic infrastructure for big municipalities. No, what they did was they ran data processing operations. They were called out. They weren't called outsourcing them, but that's what they were. They would send their highly trained, capable programmers and scientists into these companies and help them get the most they could get out of their computers. It's amazing. So you then become the guy who runs... The firm where the where they well say- I I got that deal I'd been made a partner before that I was made a partner in '66 I got that deal, and I felt pretty good about my I was kind of full of myself frankly, <laughs> you know I think today I might be less arrogant than I was then but I was floating around I got this deal from all these other firms and I did it blah 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 by the way I didn't do it alone again mm-hmm. I, we had a team of people at Presbridge that were fabulous and when I gave this big number to Pro. 100 times earnings was an unheard of multiple. Yeah, and you got more than that. He got 115. He thought when he asked me driving through the tunnel to sign the papers in Jersey, he said, well, this is when you're going to tell me I'm not getting 100. I said, you're right. And he got a little perplexed. And his wife, Margo, was in the car with me, and we were in the back seat of a limousine, two seats looking at each other. And I said, yeah, you're not going to get 100 times earnings. He said, see, Margo, the role I like up here, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, look, if you want 100, that's okay with me. So then Margo said, well, what were you going to do with it? I said, well, I was going to do it at 115 times earnings, but if he only wants 100. Yeah, that's fine. We did it at 115 times earnings, by the way. It was a good do, that's what you say. It was, and by the way, I think of that company with enormous respect. They had... 
they're the most wonderful people in the company. They were motivated. They were high class. They were very professional. Lots of military people in that company. Bunches of, don't right? forget, this is, this is kids coming out of Vietnam. Yeah. We had, and he had these kids and he gave them opportunities. Mm-hmm. He gave them awesome responsibilities and the ability to make decisions. And if they made bad decisions, it wasn't the end of their career. Okay, I know. It's so juicy. It's so fun. You just want to listen to the guy talk. We've got a couple more segments with Ken Langone, and it is really a treat. It's wonderful to have a guy like this in the studio. And if he sounds as normal as you think he really was, we felt it in the studio. Mark and I just loved this dude. By the way... It's been many months since that interview, and I have not yet gotten my invitation to his house where he said he makes the best eggplant parmesan ever. But I'll have to hold him to that at a different time. While we're on the break, think about the questions you have for 2019 and give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back with our interview with Ken Langone. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back with Jill on Money, and we are so lucky because we are rebroadcasting parts of our interview, some of which did not make air the first time around, of our interview with Ken Langone, American businessman, all-around cool dude. Now, Ken Langone was instrumental in bringing together all of the money, but also the right people to start a huge company, the Home Depot. And in this part of our interview, he recounts what happened. And it's kind of fascinating because on one hand, you say he met some guys, they had an idea, and he started to think about what he could do to raise some money. That's true. But you need someone to marshal a good idea and get the right people and then get the financing. And when you hear about all the pieces that came together, you don't think, oh, I could do that because it sounds actually pretty darn hard. And it wasn't all smooth sailing. He tells you the good, the bad and certainly some of the ugly. So here's Ken Langone's story of the Home Depot. So I want to just flash forward and. I would love for you to tell the story of Bernie Marcus, Arthur Blank, and the roots of the Home Depot. Okay. The roots started, a very good friend of mine in Philadelphia, Gary Obam, had a chain of home centers who I had brought public called Panorama. And they were experiencing difficulties, 75, 76. And Gary had hired me as a consultant. And we were in his office one day, and I said, look, I said, we ought to have a model. If we're going to fix this, we got to look who's, who's the best out there. Now, the home center industry then was regional. You had Rickle, Pergamon, Channel here. You had the Heckinger's in the Mid-Atlantic. You had Scotty's in Florida. And you had Handy Dan and Angel's out in the way. He's, so the guy says, Ken, Ken is a guy out there, Bernie Marcus. He's fabulous. Does a great job. I said, okay, can you get me an appointment? Long story short, the next day, I was in L.A. having lunch with Bernie Marcus. And I met him, and then and now, spectacular human being. And we bonded. And he was running a company that was 19% owned by the public and 81% owned by an industrial company called Dalen. I ended up buying almost all of 19% in the market. I kept buying it it for myself and for clients. And he persuaded me one day to sell my stock to the guy that owned 81%. I said, look, the guy doesn't like you, and he's going to fire you. And he said, no, no, he needs me. He doesn't know the business. I said, I'm telling you, I'm warning you. No. So this guy paid me a very significant premium to buy us out, all of myself and my investors. Four months after he bought us out, he fired Bernie, he fired Arthur, he fired Ron Brill. And Bernie calls me up, no health insurance, no stock, no income, three kids, I need a job. I said, forget about a job. When can you come to New York? And the next day he comes to New York. We sit in the Peacock Alley at the Waldorf Astoria with him, myself, and a fellow by the name Jerry Grossman. Uh, a lawyer, a labor lawyer, and they had committed a labor law violation. That's all it was, civic. Mm-hmm. It means the union gets certified. Bernie earlier had told me that we owned the stock for two years. In that two-year period, Bernie and I used to go walk store openings. When they were opening a new store, I'd go with them, and it was wonderful. And one walk in Houston, he says to me, don't get too excited because somebody's going to figure out the Achilles heel and is going to change this industry. 
I don't know. He said, well, tell me. I said, tell me. No, no, I can't. I can't. I'm not going to tell you. So when he got fired, I said, he comes to New York. I said, all right, you just got hit in the ass with a golden horseshoe. Let's do that thing you said is going to change the industry. He said, what do you mean? And I t- reminded him, and he said to me, let's do it. And we initially went to Perot, and it wasn't going to work. So I went and lined up 40 people that all had done very well with Handy Dan, and we put together $2 million, Arthur, Bernie, and right after we incorporated, they found another guy, a merchandise and genius by the name of Pat Farah, mm-hmm. and we brought him on board. And he, he was two months after we were founded, but he was effectively one of the founders of the company as well. And the rest is history. So one thing that I found interesting was that uh, started with a... The aim was to open four stores in Atlanta. Two of them opened, but it was not so We had a cool... We had, no. Hell, early on, Bernie was standing in front of the store offering people a dollar if they would walk in and look what was in the store. And why do you think that was? Because the concept was so new? Yeah, it was brand new. When you had this huge... And, you know, we had challenges. We didn't have a lot of money. And so when they were negotiating with the vendors, we got the vendors because we didn't want to have empty shelves. They gave us empty boxes with their labels on them, so people thought we had all this merchandise and all the overheads it was air. Mm. Mm. So when did you have the sense that it was going to really be as big as it became? What was the beginning when you were sitting? When, when Bernie got fired. Talk about that. I, look, I Bernie is fabulous. And I knew Bernie was going to be a big success. And Bernie knew the business. Bernie had a great knack for having good people around him. That's critical. Mm-hmm. So I had a good start there, and Bernie had, and we still have, a very close relationship. Mm -hmm. We had to persuade Arthur to come. He was not sure he wanted to do it. Pat Farrow was running his own store, which was was doing very well in terms of physically, but financially it was a disaster, and eventually he had to bankrupt it. It was then we got Pat to join up with us, and we did it. But I never thought we'd have 400,000 employees, but I thought we had a chance to have a great business. So I want to talk a little bit about, I want to kind of finish the Home Depot section just by right. talking a little bit about how you have these founders. Obviously, it's getting big. There's different skill sets mm-hmm. of starting something right. and being mm-hmm. entrepreneurial right. and running a mature organization. Right. So talk a little bit about finding Arthur's successor. Okay. Bernie, Arthur, and I had agreed that we didn't have anybody in the company that if something happened to Arthur. So we hired Hydric and Struggles. And it turns out at the time, coincidentally, I was on a board of General Electric, and this was, was, was when Jack Welch was going to make his decision about his successor. Unfortunately, he picked the wrong guy. It <laughs> turned out to be a disaster. Bob Nardelli was the only one, and Bob had done a great job. I was on the board of GE, and I saw the great as an operator. Yep. And this is what we needed. We, you know, we, we were growing. We were, don't forget, we were opening 200 stores a year then, staggering amount of stores, and it was getting away from us. And so we brought Bob in. In fairness, Bob did a great job for four years. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, he sort of lost whatever it was. What he had done in the first four years left a lot to be desired, and we had to make a change. We had a serious morale issue in the store. What do you think, in your mind, could you have identified some of Nardelli's weaknesses early on? I can't answer it objectively. Bob got caught up in whatever it was but it was beginning to unravel this culture, this very precious culture we had about these kids that work in the stores. These kids are special. All right, one more segment. We, we wrangled him for quite a time, long time. He was in the studio forever. More with Ken Langone when we return. It's Jill on Money. Go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and you can read, listen, and watch all the great content that we produce. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. Uh, You know, it is the 10-year anniversary of one of the biggest scandals ever in American history. Yep, 10 years ago, Bernie Madoff, he was caught in the Biggest Ponzi scheme ever, ever. He duped so many people, so many smart people. So in this part of our interview with Ken Langone, 
he has an amazing story about Bernie Madoff. Because as things were unraveling for Madoff, he approached our guest, Ken Langone, the author of I Love Capitalism. He approached Ken Langone, one of his people, and said, I really want to meet with him. And so Langone basically said, okay, I'll meet with him. And as you hear him recount this story, you will just gasp because his gut is so fantastic. And this is a great lesson for all of us. When something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Here's the last part of our interview with Ken Langone. So I want to end because Mark is obsessed with Bernie Madoff. We have had okay. Diana Henriquez, who wrote The Wizard of Lies on the program. Right. She's a friend of mine. Mm. And um, you were featured in the movie version of that. Not exactly the right way to recount the story. So, But it uh, didn't happen that way. Yeah, exactly. That's what I want. I want to hear what happened when you met Bernie okay. Madoff. 2008, in the middle of the mm, crash... The week Lehman Brothers went broke, yep. we sold a company we had a big interest in called Choice Point to Reed Elsevier for cash. And thank God for Marty Lipton and his firm, Ed Hurley and the gang. They wrote a contract with Reed Elsevier that you couldn't get a drop of water through. Mm -hmm. Reed tried to claim force majeure. Mm -hmm. And we said, uh-uh, mm -hmm. we're settling. And so we got Friday night of the same week that Lehman went broke. <laughs> you got a big wire in. We got $4.3 billion in cash. <laughs> That wasn't all ours, but we had a good piece. Yeah. A very dear friend of mine, a wonderful man, called me up and said, look, Bernie Madoff would like to meet you. This was a month and a half after that, in November. He said, well, why don't you meet with him? And so I have a partner that lived out in Sun Valley then, and I called up Steve Holzman, and I said, Steve, do me a favor. I said, I'm going to meet this guy Madoff. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I said, but you probably might, because Steve understood all these different strategies and stuff. So Steve came in. And for the first 40, we're in his offices in the Lipstick Building on 3rd mm -hmm. Avenue. He's showing me all this art like I really care. And finally, I said, Bernie, i got to go to a dinner. And I said, can we sit down and talk? And he's sure. So he sits down and he starts talking about this and that and the other thing and this put and that call and this straddle. And I'm sitting there, my eyes are glazing over. And Steve is listening. And then he says to me, and look, he said, I can only take $500 million for this deal. He said, it's not big enough for me to give all of my existing clients so I'm going to give it to you. Uh, my first reaction was, wait a minute. How would I feel if I was one of his clients? And I found out he's got this phenomenal bird's nest on the ground. But he's given it to a guy he's never done business with before and keeping me out of it. I didn't say anything. I said, well, Bernie, i got to leave for dinner. And so we thanked him. We got in the elevator. We went downstairs. And I said, Steve, I don't want to do business with this guy. I thanked him very much. I said, I don't want to do business with this guy. He said, why? I said, look. If he's going to screw his existing customers, I might be the next one to get screwed. I don't want to do it. As I think it's bad faith not to offer this deal, which is supposed to be a slam dunk deal to his people. Mm -hmm. He's well. Let me think about it. So the Friday after Thanksgiving of that week, Steve called me and says, "You know, Ken, you're right. I don't want to do it." I said, "Well, do me a favor. Call him up and be polite and respectful. Just tell him we're going to pass." It. And that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Hollywood likes license. You know, they need drama. Exactly. Meeting this guy, he was teetering on the edge of. He was slick. He really? I wouldn't want to play poker with this guy. He knew he was going down when he right. was talking to us. That's what I think, like, timing-wise. If I was playing poker with this guy, he'd have all my clothes, he'd have all my houses, <laughs> he'd have... This guy was Mr. Cool. I want to wrap up, and um, I know that the that capitalism is sort of the theme of the book and why you love it. That's really the story of your life. I want to also point out a couple of the things that mm. you say that... Um, you have curiosity. You are notorious for asking more questions than any other director on a board. Yep. Um, I didn't give a blank if my question showed how stupid I was. You also, I guess, what was interesting is that um, you note that this is not a zero-sum game. And you, you say in the book you were a lifelong Republican for some time. Mm -hmm. But you also have said, spoken publicly about how you're concerned about income inequality. Absolutely. Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. If the gap between... The well-off and the not-so-well-off gets big enough. You put the people that are not-so-well-off to say, hey, you know what, nothing's working for me. What happens? You get a Cuba, you get a Venezuela, you get a Russia. We've got to figure a way out to bring everybody to the party. The, the most exciting thing to me about Home Depot, a lot of things about it, 
We have 3,000 kids today who started in the parking lot, fresh out of high school, pushing carts in. They're multimillionaires. They're Is that mul- because of the stock or they work yeah, their no, way no, out? No, yeah, no, no, stock. Totally. No, no, we give them options and stock yeah. savings. Look, I think of my mother and father. They were down at that end of the spectrum, and I know how they struggle. Mm-hmm. We've got to do a better job. I don't have all the answers, but I know we, we can't allow these people, all of us as a citizen, as citizens, we can't allow these people to not participate in this great dream called America. Well, I can't thank Ken Langone enough. He was so generous with his time. It was great to speak to him. If you want to buy his book, I Love Capitalism, good last minute pickup. If you say, hey, what's on sale? What's there? What's that? Do it before the end of the year. It's so much fun. And we will be back with more. One little bitty segment, a question from one of you. It's Jill on Money. Back in a minute. You are back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question... Come on, we want to hear from you. Anytime, anywhere. You can go to jillonmoney.com, click on the Contact Us button. While you're there, you can listen to past shows or maybe any part of this one if you've missed it. Go there, Jill on Money. Uh, We got a follow-up from uh, Kevin, who was asking about REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts, and he was asking about uh, a new investment with a REIT, which he clarified is uh, an income REIT uh, from the BlackRock Group. And he said, is 10% investment a fair amount of money with a million dollar portfolio? You know, yes, if you said I want 10% total in REITs, I wouldn't put 10% in one asset. It's not it's it it's not gonna kill you, but I, I do sort of feel like, Kevin, if you could um maybe stick to the ground rule of you know, five percent in any single asset. You know, that way, maybe you pick two different REITs or maybe you pick that income REIT and you compare it with a, an index REIT. And, you know, 10 percent in real estate is not a crazy amount of money. Certainly just understand the risk. So um, I think we're cool with that. That's OK. Uh, OK. Oh, boy. I've got some long ones. I'm trying to get something here. OK, here we go. Here's a uh, Tina wants to know. What's your advice on a fixed indexed annuity? I'm a novice. I'm interested in guaranteed income after retirement. I don't know why we're this. You know what it is? Annuities appeal to our sense of safety and security. But you all think that when you buy these products, it comes basically like free, you know, as if the person selling it to you is working at the Red Cross. Here's what I would say, Tina. If you're a novice and you want guaranteed income, yes, an annuity can give you guaranteed income. But that guarantee comes at a very high cost. So before you do this, please send us everything that you know about this annuity and come on the show. Let us talk to you. Let's see if we you really need this. It Again, this appeals to your sense of security. That is an emotional appeal. I want to I want to honor it, but I want to make sure this is actually a good deal for you. So get back in touch with us, Tina, will you please? Thank you. All right, and thank you for listening. It's been a great show. Hey, I want to do something fun right after we get off the air. Why don't you pre-order my new book? It's dropping very shortly, beginning of February. Pre-order it right now. You can go to JillOnMoney.com. Click on the link that's the book, and uh, you can get in on that action. Great, fabulous, wonderful show. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week.